Hi, my name is Mira Grover, and uh, thank you for watching this short video on different ways to do buprenorphine naloxone inductions. Before we get started, please remember that patient-centered care always involves lots of patient education and consent. So uh, please do not make any medication changes or start patients on medications without their consent or if it does not meet their goals. Always remember to check your own biases and manage your countertransference. Uh, addiction medicine is just a tricky thing and it, there's lots of stigma around it and we want to make sure we're not contributing to that stigma in our practice. This is of course an educational video not a patient specific advice uh, format so uh, please always uh, consult an addiction medicine specialist if you have any questions or if you have any patient specific questions or you need support. I do not have any conflicts of interest to disclose for this video. Okay, so let's talk about buprenorphine naloxone, also known as suboxone. So the way that buprenorphine works is that it's a partial opioid agonist with a high affinity to the opioid receptors. Um, it also has a ceiling effect for respiratory depression. Naloxone is just in the suboxone to prevent um, injection, like diversion of the suboxone. So if you injected suboxone, the naloxone in it essentially acts as naloxone would and reverses the opioids. So uh, it, it's very difficult to divert suboxone through injection drug use. Um, the buprenorphine itself is sublingually uh, absorbed. The naloxone in it, it is not, it does not work. It's not effective if it's sublingually absorbed or if it's orally absorbed. So it is really just there to prevent diversion. Patients who are on Suboxone in the community and present to acute care should be maintained on their Suboxone in acute care. Uh, they may require lower doses or uh, they may require higher doses of hydromorph or other pain management. Um, please consult addiction medicine if, if that occurs. If the patient needs to initiate Suboxone, there are lots of different ways to do it. The reason Suboxone is tricky to initiate is that the buprenorphine has such a high affinity to the opioid receptors that if there's other opioids on board, so hydromorph or fentanyl, um, the buprenorphine comes and it kicks those other uh, opioids off of the receptors. And that causes what we have termed precipitated withdrawal, which is this instant, severe, very bad opioid withdrawal. We want to avoid that at all costs. So we are going to try our best to um, make sure that that does not happen. And that's why the induction of Suboxone is tricky. Once a patient is already on Suboxone, then you can add other opioids in. It doesn't matter from a precipitated withdrawal perspective. If they're on a good enough dose of Suboxone, you can have other opioids on board and you don't need to worry about precipitated withdrawal. Um, we always talk about having carries. So you can have carries of Suboxone. Uh, because the risk of diversion is low and the risk of adverse effects if people destabilize because they could not get to the pharmacy every day to dose their Suboxone, that risk is very high because we are in an opioid crisis right now. So um, we want to make sure that we are reducing the barriers to people being able to access Suboxone if they want to. Okie dokie. Uh, there's different forms of buprenorphine. So there's suboxone tabs, that's two milligram or eight milligram sublingual tabs. There is the butrans patch, which is very, very low dose. It's 10 micrograms an hour or 20 micrograms per hour. It is not covered. Um, so it's very, very expensive to have in community. We typically only use it in acute care. There's a suboxone film, two milligram, four milligram, eight milligram, and 12 milligram films. These are now newly covered by NIHB, which is excellent. Um, these films can be really helpful for patients, especially because some patients really do not like the taste of the suboxone. Um, so having the film is more helpful. And then of course, there's the sublocate injection, which is sort of the depot version of suboxone. It's a subcutaneous injection that's monthly. It's at 300 milligram strength or 100 milligram strength. We're gonna get into each of these things, how to use them. Okay, so let's first talk about a suboxone home induction. Suboxone comes in these two milligram or eight milligram tabs. It's covered by most things. Um, the idea is, you wait, you wait until those opioids are out of the system. You wait 24 to 48 hours, sometimes even longer if it was something like methadone or a long acting opioid. 
you wait until the patient's in really bad withdrawal. So like moderate to severe withdrawal. Cows of at least 12, but the higher the cows, the lower the risk of precipitated withdrawal. Then once people are arriving, then you start with your two milligram suboxone test dose. And you hope that that doesn't precipitate them. You hope that they were in bad enough withdrawal. There was not uh, enough of the opioids on the receptors had left. And then you start with that suboxone dose. Precipitated withdrawal, as we've talked about, it does look like the worst withdrawal imaginable. It's very, very bad, very, very quickly. It can sometimes be confused with just a progression of worsening uh, opioid withdrawal. So uh, important to be aware that uh, it may just be that the natural progression of opioid withdrawal is worsening and that this isn't precipitated withdrawal. If the patient does not precipitate, then uh, it's two to four milligrams every hour to two hours until the patient feels better. Uh, it's a max of 12 to 16 milligrams on day one. And then on day two, it's a max of 24 milligrams. Um, we can go up to 32 milligrams. That's not on the monograph, but um, it is in the guidelines. And it's typically how we practice in Calgary, at least, is uh, 32 milligrams is sort of the highest dose. There, of course, are patients who are higher on higher doses than that. But uh, you should be consulting with addiction medicine if that's, if that's the case. Um, we titrate subo suboxone to cravings. So it's not, we're not just trying to get patients out of opioid withdrawal. We're trying to treat their opioid use disorder. So we're, if they still have cravings, we're going to keep going up. And the word titrate means to increase the dose. The word taper means to reduce the dose. So we are going to continue titrating that suboxone until the patient doesn't have cravings. Now, cravings is a totally different thing than triggers. So a trigger is like you walk into a room, all your best friends are there, and they're all using. That is a trigger. To use and no pill in the world is unfortunately going to be able to fix that. Okay, psychotherapy is the only way to manage things like that and manage those situations, those curveballs that come your way. But cravings are when the brain feels like, oh, I really need this substance to live, and it just continues to make you think about it, to make you want to use. So boxone can actually help with those cravings, which is so helpful for a lot of patients. So we titrate to cravings, we lower the barriers, making sure that people have easy access to Suboxone. Okay, speaking of barriers, for some patients, they're unable to manage going into such severe withdrawal. They cannot do a home induction because they cannot tolerate the withdrawal required. Enter the concept of a Suboxone micro-induction. So a micro-induction is when you kind of start with a tiny, tiny little dose of Suboxone and you just sneak it right into those opioid receptors. So it's a small enough dose that the brain does not notice it. Uh, and it does not cause precipitated withdrawal because it's a small enough dose. When that happens, you just take a little dose one day and a little dose the next day and a slightly bigger dose the day after that. And you slowly work that suboxone into the system, all the while concurrently being on other opioids. This helps the patient to avoid a withdrawal phase. Um, the downside is it takes a long time. It can take seven to 14 days to get onto a good dose of a micro induction of a good dose of Suboxone. So you can do once daily dosing or twice daily dosing. So if you Google or look on PubMed, there's lots of examples of um, micro induction schedules that you can follow. And there's a lot of different ways to do this. But one of the ways would be to take a two milligram tab cut it into four, so into quarters, so a quarter of a two milligram tab on the first day, that's 0.5 milligrams of Suboxone. Then on the second day, you could take 0.5 milligrams twice a day. Then on the third day, you take maybe one milligram twice a day, so a half a tab twice a day. And you just slowly increase that dose of Suboxone in the system. Um, Patients would continue to use their illicit opioids or um, if they're in hospital or acute care, whatever opioids they have prescribed at, during this time. So they stay on their other opioids to treat their opioid withdrawal. If they have stopped using illicit opioids, but they still are, cannot manage the withdrawal, you can also prescribe slow, slow release oral morphine or cadian uh, at the same time concurrently just to help manage that withdrawal daily witness dosing for the cadian um, while you're doing that suboxone microinduction. Um, and then that cadian stops near the end of the microinduction, you ramp up the suboxone dose. 
Um, the tricky thing about a micro induction, if you miss some of those doses and you just kind of jump ahead, you're going to precipitate. If you miss some of those doses and the suboxone drains out of your system, you're going to precipitate. So it, it can just be very tricky. It's also tricky for pharmacists to like be like, here, take this quarter of a tab today and then the two quarters of the tab tomorrow. Like it's just a tricky, finicky thing. So make sure that the pharmacy is really aware and comfortable with doing micro inductions. Make sure that the patient is really aware and comfortable with it as well. Okay, so there's also a rapid microinduction. We do this uh, quite often in acute care, uh, but it's a good thing to know about. So the idea is that you take one of those quarter tabs of uh, Suboxone and you, uh, you provide it every three hours for that first 24 hours. Then it, you increase it to one milligram every three hours, then two milligrams every three hours. So it's the same concept of sneaking in those doses. You're just doing it more regularly um, and uh, you're doing it in a setting where if you do cause precipitated withdrawal, you can manage it right away by treating uh, that precipitated withdrawal with acute opioids. Um, of course, this is done while using other opioids. Um, I, I typically only do this in acute care. There are other ways to do suboxone rapid microinductions as well. Just like with anything, uh, there's a lot of different ways to do this. That was just one example. Um, okay, so the Butrans patch induction. Again, we only typically do this in acute care, but this is like because of cost, not because of risk of precipitation. So the cost of the Butrans patch is usually um, prohibitively high for a lot of patients. So the idea is you put on a 20 microgram per hour patch for the first three days, and after three days, you add a second 20 micro, uh, microgram patch, microgram per hour patch. And then you have those two patches on. So then after day six from the first one, so three days after you add the second one, you can um, then treat the patient as though they are on two milligrams of Suboxone. So then from there, you can just increase their dose of Suboxone. The patch is another form of a microinduction. So they are using or they are on other uh, forms of opioids all the way through up until you start uh, increasing the dose. So that's just a way to get someone to the dose of two milligrams Suboxone. Uh, suboxone macro injections are really new to us in Calgary. So uh, the addiction medicine specialists in Calgary have only re recently started doing them. There is some evidence in the literature for them and there's uh, continually literature, new literature being published. So a day after I uh, make this video, it's going to be outdated. So really important to check the literature, discuss with addiction medicine, um, but it's just important to know that this is an option out there. So the concept of a Suboxone macro induction is that you don't have to wait that full 24 hours or that 48 hours. Um, you just wait until the patient's in kind of mild to moderate withdrawal. Uh, so you don't have to wait even until it's very severe. Then you start with a lot of Suboxone. You start with that 16 milligrams or even 24 milligrams if they're really uh, fentanyl tolerant. And you, you start at that high, high dose. And that, the idea is that it kicks off the other opioids from the receptors, but while it does that, it then fills those receptors right away because we flooded the system with Suboxone. So that's the idea behind it. I would not do that for people who are not fentanyl tolerant, um, or I would do it more, much more carefully and at lower doses for people who just have prescri illicit prescription opioid use disorder um, rather than fentanyl tolerant patients. So, but um, it can be a really helpful way to treat patients, especially if a patient comes into a merge post overdose, they've already received their naloxone. Um, this is the time to do a Suboxone macro induction because you do not have to wait several days. You don't have to hold them in the merge for that 24 hours or send them home with a home induction. You just get to start it as soon as they're in that withdrawal. So um, the first dose, 16 to 24 milligrams, uh, you can go as low as eight, but then you run the risk of not having enough Suboxone in there that they're gonna precipitate. And then you have an optional second dose that can be an hour afterwards or later that day. And that's another eight to 16 milligrams that you can add there. Typical max daily total being 24 to 32 milligrams. So it's unclear if this causes an increased rate of precipitated withdrawal. So far the literature says no, but we don't have a huge volume of cases to study. So 
Um, there's always that risk, uh, but it does seem to be working pretty well. I myself have done this on quite a few patients uh, with success each time. Okay, um, and so let's talk about sublocade. So sublocade is when um, patients have been stabilized on suboxone. Um, it's a monthly buprenorphine injection, subcutaneous in the abdomen. It has to be in one of the four quadrants of the abdomen. It starts with two, so a 300 milligram dose month one. Month two is a second 300 milligram dose. Month three, we switch from 300 milligrams to 100 milligrams. Um, and then 100 milligrams is a stabilizing dose. There are some patients who remain on that 300 milligram dose if the 100 milligram dose is found to be insufficient. So it forms this little gel that you can feel under the skin and it's marble sized for that larger dose and pea sized for the smaller dose. That is palpable throughout the month and then it fades as the month goes on, it just reduces in size. Um, if it is, of course, like if, because it forms this gel, if you inject it into a vein or an artery or the blood supply, uh, it, it's then we call that an embolus. So that's a really big problem. So don't do that. If you put it in the muscle, then people end up needing plastics. Again, big problem. So you need to do the training. If you are going to inject sublocade, you need to have done the training for that. And that is available on the sublocade website. Um, but otherwise, it's just like any other subcutaneous injection in the abdomen. Uh, it doesn't get injected anywhere else, just the abdomen. Uh, if so people choose to use illicit opioids on top of that sublocade or if they're prescribed any other opioids on top of that sublocade, that sublocade does provide some protection against overdose because of that sealing effect for buprenorphine. Um, and you can, you can also top up with a little bit more suboxone on top of it if needed. Uh, it does have a blunting effect of those other opioids though, of course. So just being aware that um, patients are aware of that. Uh, it can be surgically removed, so the, um, the sublocade gel, once it forms that little solid, it can be surgically removed from the patient if there's a severe adverse effect. Sublocade is fortunately no longer needs special authorization. It's covered by the GAP program in Alberta, and it's covered by Alberta Blue Cross as well, um, if people are on Alberta Works or EASH. Um, it is tricky to currently provide sublocade in a hospital. It's very restricted to only one hospital. Um, and we are working on trying to get this changed. So hopefully in the near future, in the next few months, we will be able to provide sublocate in hospital as well as in the community. But right now there are no restrictions on providing sublocate in the community, except that you must have done the training for it. Uh, the patients who uh, typically like sublocate, they know who they are. They're like, ooh, that's for me, you know? Um, and of all of my patients who are on sublocade, all of them have wanted to stay on it. They've all done really, really well. Uh, lots of patients love not having to take a medication every single day. It's just a once a month thing. It's done. They feel protected. Uh, their cravings are treated and they feel great. So it can be a very, very helpful medication for people. Um, there is some evidence coming out. So initially it was that you had to be stabilized on seven days of Spoxone before starting sublocade. There's now some evidence coming out showing that shorter intervals are just as well, especially for people who have been on sublocade or Suboxone before. Um, and some people are even doing macro injections with sublocade. So initial test dose with Suboxone, if that went well, then just a sublocade injection. These are all very, very early practices. Um, and I would definitely consult addiction medicine if you are going to be giving sublocate in any way, um, because uh, sublocate is, is a trickier medication. So consult addiction medicine, but be aware that this is an option. Uh, the other thing about sublocate is that you can, it does not have to be a prescriber that gives it. It can be a nurse, it can be a pharmacist, um, and so it can just be an easier way for people to have their opioid use to sort of treat it. Okay, well, thank you very much for watching this video on on all the different ways to induce Suboxone, and I hope it has been helpful. Um, if you have any questions at all, please consult Addiction Medicine. Thank you.